production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com. Good evening from Charleston, I'm Eric Douglas. Welcome back to West Virginia Public Broadcasting Series, The Legislature Today. Tonight we have a recap of Governor Jim Justice's 2022 State of the State Address, which he gave last night. Just a day before this year's legislative session began, the governor tested positive for COVID-19 and was forced to postpone his speech. Also tonight, we hear from members of the minority leadership from the Senate and the House who share their reactions to the governor's speech. But first, reporter Liz McCormick wraps up news from week three of the legislative session. The third week of the 2022 West Virginia legislative session saw the passage of what is arguably the most important bill to Senate leadership this year. On Wednesday, the Senate passed Senate Bill 1, which would create a mining mutual insurance company to address the costs of cleaning up abandoned coal mines in the state. Senate President Craig Blair of Berkeley County is the lead sponsor of the bill. He came down from the president's podium to voice his support. Blair says the company will act as an insurance policy for the state mining industry. By creating this mutual, it will also protect our severance tax collections as well and our commitment to having a baseload energy supply in this state which coal provides. If we wouldn't do this, then it's just a roulette wheel. We have no idea what's going to happen. But this provides a voluntary, it's not mandatory, ability for our end mining industry to be able to purchase these reclamation bonds and to continue providing the vital baseload energy supply that coal does. According to the bill, the state would provide an initial 50 million non-interest bearing loan to the company to get started. Blair says the money would not come out of the state's mine reclamation trust fund. Senate Bill 1 passed 32 to 0 and is now awaiting consideration in the House Energy Committee. Another bill related to energy that passed out of the upper chamber was Senate Bill 4. The bill would lift a 25-year-old ban on the construction of nuclear power facilities in the state. While the bill has bipartisan support, Senator Mike Wolfel of Cabell County was the only Democrat to speak in favor of the legislation on the floor. He's also a sponsor of the bill. This bill makes us a leader in terms of uh, being, as you've said, all of the above in terms of our energy sources. Uh, I know the Nucor uh, Corporation has asked about uh, what our future plans may be, and this would be a step, in, as they see it, in the right direction. Other Democrats in the chamber spoke in opposition to the bill, though, such as Senator Bob Beach, a Democrat from Monongalia County, who says he's concerned about national security. So there's only five states east of the Mississippi who do not have these facilities. I think those are safe states, in my opinion. And I would like West Virginia to be and continue to be one of those safe states. The bill passed 24 to 7 with some Republicans joining Democrats in opposition. Across the rotunda in the House of Delegates, lawmakers had their eyes on a few health related bills this week. House Bill 4252 reduces the copay cap on insulin and devices. House Health Chair Delegate Matthew Rohrbach, a Republican from Cabell County, is the bill's lead sponsor. He spoke to the cost pressures on families with young children suffering from type 1 diabetes. Obviously, technology has a cost. And as the cost has went up on pumps, continuous glucose monitors, uh, the old days where you just had the stylets and the alcohol pads and the glucometer, that's kind of old school now. So this is an attempt to particularly help our families. 
House Bill 4252 passed overwhelmingly in the House with a vote of 94 to 3. It now awaits consideration in the Senate Health Committee. Also related to health, the House passed House Bill 4074. It would create Megan's Law and require schools in West Virginia to provide eating disorder and self-harm training for teachers and students. The bill passed 93 to 0 and is now in Senate education. As we close on week three of the 2022 session, lawmakers have introduced more than 1,500 bills this year. For the legislature today, I'm Liz McCormick. Thanks for that, Liz. Reporter Curtis Tate watched the governor's State of the State address last night and brings us this next story. Justice was supposed to deliver the speech more than two weeks ago until he tested positive for the coronavirus. Now, in all that, you know, whether at times I was 15 minutes late or 20 minutes late or sometimes even later than that, I've never really been 15 days late. <laughs> Justice noted the pandemic's continuing toll on West Virginia. But I'd like you to all stand and us bow in a moment of prayer. We have now lost 5,697 people. Otherwise, the governor had mostly positive things to say in his fourth you know state of the state. So he highlighted the economic development news of recent weeks and the state's low unemployment rate. Justice boasted about the state landing three major employers, including an electric bus manufacturer and a steel maker. You know, they went fishing, did they not? You know, and they caught some big, big, big fish. After lawmakers approved a large incentive package in a special session, Nucor agreed to bring a steel plant to Mason County and hundreds of jobs with it. And along came Moby Dick. And boom, we got it. We absolutely have so many things to be thankful for, but we've got new core in West Virginia right now. Justice said the state's deficit is gone, replaced by a $57 million positive balance. Still, his budget request is basically flat. He called on lawmakers to enact a 5% pay increase for state employees. Justice praised the state for increasing its focus on tourism and attracting new residents. I've said over and over, and you may think, oh gosh, why does he say these things? I've said, you know, any frog that's not proud of his own pond's not much of a frog. <laughs> and forever, forever, we must have not been real proud of our own pond. He called on lawmakers to create a Build West Virginia tax credit to encourage the construction of more housing. Turning to education, Justice said he wants the state to cover the cost of college classes for high school students. He also wants to make computer programming and coding classes mandatory in high school. Justice touted his Roads to Prosperity project, which has repaired tens of thousands of miles of highways statewide. In 2019, they did 30,000 miles in West Virginia. In 2020, they did 39,000. In 21, they did 47,000 miles. My God, I live, we're going to run out of miles. The governor encouraged the state to tackle yet another infrastructure challenge, connecting every resident with broadband. Justice ended his remarks by bringing Baby Dog into the chamber, a cherished member of the first family and a symbol of the governor's vaccination campaign. But this has been the year of Baby Dog, hasn't it? And so she's got to come on out here. Come on out here, baby. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Curtis Tate. <laughs> Thank you, Curtis. Reporter June Leffler sat down with House Minority Whip Sean Fluherty from Ohio County and Senate Minority Leader Stephen Baldwin from Greenbrier County to get their response to the governor's speech. Here's what they had to say. Hello, Senator Baldwin. Hello, Delegate Fluherty. Thank you for being on the program today. Um, could you both just start off with a brief response to what you heard during the governor's state of the state last night? Delegate Fluherty, we'll start with you. Thank you, thanks for having me this morning. Well, quite honestly, I was embarrassed by the actions last night by the governor. He showed his ass last night, not just baby dogs, to the world to see. Now every headline this morning will be about that. The decorum in this legislature has fallen with every passing day with the governor at the helm. He has lowered the bar on the conduct, by his, by his conduct, for his entire administration. Last night we didn't hear anything about who was really responsible for the projects he announced last night, in my opinion, and that's Joe Biden and Democrats in Congress. They're the ones who deserve some thanks this morning and last night during the State of the State. 
And I think he missed an opportunity to really bridge the gap in the polarization of politics that we have today. And that was something he missed out on. And uh, quite frankly, I wanted to hear from him. The credit deserves to go where it is due. And that's what Joe Biden and Joe Manchin and Democrats in Congress who were able to put an infrastructure bill together that helped, br- helped bring new core here, help bring green power here, and the jobs that come with it. And I thought that was a missed opportunity. Thank you. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, June. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was hopeful as the speech started because it began with a call to bipartisanship um, and, you know, let, let's get beyond what happens in D.C. Unfortunately, I, I thought the rest of the speech um, just sort of went down that, that same old partisan political path. You know, he, he talked about, you know, let's let's not throw rocks at each other. Um, but then we proceeded to throw rocks at each other for the rest of the speech, and including the ending, which um, which I thought was an unfortunate response to an unfortunate situation. Um, I thought it was, as Delegate Fluharty said, an, an opportunity. You know, we are a bitterly divided nation and state right now, and I think it's incumbent upon us in positions of leadership to do every everything we can to, to bridge that gap and bridge that divide. Um, and I, I just felt like we had a missed opportunity to do that yesterday evening. Let's go ahead and get into what's going on during the session. So what are your legislative priorities and what will make for a successful session? Um, Delegate Fluharty, go ahead. Well, I think priorities from the Democratic side are figuring out a path for our young people to stay here and to bring those back who have left. And we've done that. We've proposed opportunities in legislation like the State and the State Act and other pieces of legislation designed to keep our best and brightest here. And I know the governor last night tried to pretend that we don't have a problem with people leaving the state. Now, you wouldn't know that because he didn't even mention it last night about young people and their priorities and how they want to go about their business and their opportunities to come back to West Virginia or remain here after graduation. Completely missed an opportunity to talk about that last night because it's not even on his radar. So it is on our radar. It is on the Democratic platform radar. And it's something we've been pushing for years, and we're hoping that through this legislative process, we'll finally be heard. It remains to be seen thus far in the legislative process. Uh, Senator Baldwin. Sure. Well, I'd like to talk about one thing in particular, um, which is child welfare. We did not hear anything about our foster children last night. We did not hear anything about Child Protective Services last night. Um, And in my mind, those are two of the areas that need significant attention this session. If they do not get that attention that they deserve, um, I will be extremely disappointed. I've been doing meetings um, with folks from across uh, the region that I represent in southern West Virginia who work in social services and child protective services. And the situations that our most vulnerable young people face every day, I think would um, uh, would just bring a lot of folks to tears across West Virginia. Um, they need additional resources in order to do their job and take care of the most vulnerable among us. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I, I, I just didn't hear very much at all about that last night. We did hear about a pay raise um, for public employees, which is important. A 5% pay raise in CPS is not going to do much of anything. Um, so I, I think we have an opportunity uh, in the coming 45 days, and I pray we take advantage of that uh, because the situation is dire. Senator Baldwin, if the governor did not speak to that issue, um, do you think that your party or the Republican lawmakers are going to address that issue this session? I am hopeful about that um, because it's the right thing to do, and I think there's bipartisan support for for doing the right thing for our kids. Um, I, I've had discussions with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle about this issue, and I, I think there is um, significant support for it. Um, at the end of the day, this is a short process, and it goes by very quickly, and the air can be easily taken out of the room by um, uh, priorities that... Uh, um, interact with each other. And I'm afraid um, that that's what could happen. You know, we all say this is a priority, but until we get something done, um, that's that's what shows. You know, that's what shows your real priorities, your actions. Sure. So, yes, they need to make it a priority, but what would be, you know, one or two things that 
actionable items that could resolve it? A couple specific things. Uh, number one, recruitment retention for CPS workers. Y you've got to do that through filling vacancies, uh, by raising pay, by providing mental health support for CPS workers who themselves face traumatic events every day and don't have anybody to turn to except the same providers in their area that they refer their children to. And you can't have that sort of dual relationship. Um, adding tele, uh, telework options uh, for CPS workers. Um, there are a myriad of things we can do. Another specific thing is the child intake system, so the child abuse hotline. Um, those calls need to make it to the local CPS offices, and those offices need to be staffed by enough people to follow up on them so that we can know what's going on in our community with our most vulnerable kids. Let's go to economic investment. It's a huge priority this session. Is the majority party going about this the right way? How would your party like to bring economic growth to the state? Let's start with Delegate Fluharty. Well, I think it starts with our people. I mean, we can give corporate carve-outs and handouts all day long, which we've done with the new core deal. I hope it comes to fruition, but we've been down this path before. The governor last night said that this is the largest investment that we've had in our state's history by private enterprise. He's also said that before. It was called the China deal. Now. I haven't seen that come to fruition. Have any of you? I don't think so. So I think it starts with our people, and particularly our young people. And in, going back to our original point, the Democratic Party wants to keep our best and brightest here. Invest in our people. That's what we need to have happen. And we're not doing that. We're giving these corporate handouts, these carve-outs, from a legislature that I thought was about smaller government and free market enterprise. Uh, but if you see what we've done in the first few weeks in the legislature, it's all about a handout to particular companies who may want to come here. Well, I hope they do, and I hope they bring jobs with them. But you can't just make that happen through a carve-out deal. You have to build from within. And I feel like we're missing an opportunity to, to really reflect on our intellectual capital in this state, our young people, those in college who are going to jump into the workforce. Right now in West Virginia, young people default on their student loans at the second highest rate in the entire country. They're not entering the workforce. They're not buying homes. They're not buying vehicles. They're really up against it. So a lot of them leave for greener pastures for higher pay. And we're not doing things to incentivize them staying here. And until we start focusing on building from within and building that intellectual capital, known as our people and our young people in particular, we're going to be playing the same song over and over again. We're going to be fishing, casting that reel that he talked about last night, but we're not getting many bites back. And that's the problem that I see with the governor's plan and the GOP plan in particular. Senator Baldwin. Sure. Thanks, June. Well, I, you know, I too am excited about these opportunities that the governor spoke about last night. I'm, I'm excited about the opportunity that Nucor brings and green power. Um, it takes so much to get one of those companies here, though. It, it exacts a significant toll um, on the state budget, on the state economy, to be able to bring those major businesses um, into the state of West Virginia. Um, so, you know, I, while I think those are good things, I hope they're successful. I, I think they will be successful. I agree with Delegate Fluharty that we've got to smoke, focus on what has been our bread and butter in West Virginia, and that's small business. You know, I come from southern West Virginia um, where we don't have as many of these major manufacturing um, opportunities, for example, but we have a wonderful small business economy centered around tourism, for example, uh, mom and pop shops and restaurants with just a couple of employees that really make a huge difference in our economy. Um, so I, I think that is the path of the future for West Virginia, uh, not just these major corporations, but the mom and pop, the small businesses um, that our families run here uh, in especially the southern part of the state. Delegate Fluharty, this question goes right to what you were just saying. Uh, job opportunities are essential for keeping and bringing people to the state. Um, that said, people need more than just a steady job to want to live in West Virginia. Um, aside from economic oppor opportunities, where does West Virginia need to invest its resources? Well, it's a quality of life issue. It, young people, and we've, we've learned anything from this pandemic, it's that we're in a remote world now. Young people will move here if they feel like they can live here thrive here and help build back this state. And more importantly, they have to feel like they're wanted here. And we have a state where, based upon your sexual orientation, you could be fired from your job or kicked out of your home. Is that the message you want to send to the rest of the country? Young people are willing to come here. We have a thriving tourism program. We have many opportunities. And the governor's right about one thing. The four seasons we have, I think, it's something that's a selling point for our state and the location of our state. 
But our state needs to start making the national media for positive things and reinforcing the positivity in this state and not the negativity. And the first thing we should do is, is give powers to the cities, which we try to do, that they're taking back on a daily basis, and pass a statewide non-discrimination platform that says, you belong here, young people. We want you to feel welcome, and your quality of life is not going to be impacted just because you choose West Virginia. Senator Baldwin. I, I certainly agree with Delegate Fluharty. I can't tell you how many times I hear from young people um, about the importance of non-discrimination non legislation in terms of their um, interest and hope in West Virginia's future. So that, that's got to be um, right at the top. The other thing that I would mention in terms of um, investments in our future, investments in our economy, is broadband. You know, Delegate Fluharty mentioned there, there are young people that want to stay here, that want to move here. Uh, we've had people move to the New River Gorge area, the Greenbrier Valley over the past year, two years during the pandemic. And unfortunately, some of those same folks have had to move out of the region or move to a different home within that region because they don't have broadband or they don't have adequate affordable broadband um, in their home. And so until we solve that, we're not going to uh, be a significant destination or a place that young people choose to stay because that is the foundation of the modern economy for health care, for jobs, for education, just for everyday living. If we don't have adequate broadband, um, it, it's not going to work. And we've heard promises for years now about, you know, billion dollar strategies. Well, it's, it's time to build it. West Virginia Republicans and Democrats and at the national level might most differ on social issues. Can you tell me what big social issues are at stake this session? Delegate Fluharty. Well, it's an election year, so you know what's going to happen. We're going to have manufactured outrage for manufactured legislation that comes down so they can manufacture stories to help them get reelected. Let's just be honest about it. That's the, that's the world we live in these days. They say, don't be D.C., but you're going to see exactly that in the coming weeks here in the legislature. Social agenda issues that when you talk to the average voter on the street, that's not a top priority for them. But it's a hot button issue that they can send the mailer out on and they can demonize the opposite party, which is what we're going to see. Uh, we will see your typical social issue bills dealing with pro-life and pro-choice issues, dealing with the, the taking away of city ordinances, which I previously brought up that dealt with sexual orientation and the Crown Act. They're trying to peel back that onion and prioritize more power in Charleston. You know, we were, the GOP is supposedly the party about smaller government, and what, I, what you're seeing is they're shrinking it down, yes, to Charleston, because they want to control everything from Charleston, and not your mayors, not your city council, not your county commissioners who actually live in the communities and know what's best for them. They want to bring everything to Charleston, and I think that's a problem and a priority right now for this supermajority. Senator Baldwin. Yeah, I think we're going to, we've seen some of those already. We're going to continue to see some of those in the, the coming 45 days of the remainder of the legislature. Um, one in particular that concerns me is a Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It's known by RIFRA um, here in the halls of the Capitol and other capitals across the United States. Um, it's particularly upsetting to me. I'm, I'm a pastor. That's that's my, my calling, my daily life, my, my, my real job, <laughs> I tell people. Um, and it, it's particularly upsetting to me um, that you have politicians who use religion to further political purposes. Um, and that's what we see with many of these social issues. It's not... Uh, I find it hard to believe that the base motivation is a... Uh, religious re reason. I think the base motivation is a political reason, and I do not appreciate um, uh, faith being used in that manner. So I, I, I'm afraid that that's what we're going to see um, in the coming weeks, um, but we'll, we'll have to stay tuned and uh, do our best to fight the good fight each and every day. That's all the time we have. Senator Baldwin, Delegate Fluharty, thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. Very thank much. you for having us. Thanks for that story, June. In recent weeks, we've heard about the big economic development projects coming to the state. But what about the small towns and communities? Randy Yoey reports on the efforts to give them a better future, too. Minko County Republican Delegate Mark Dean and Marshall County Democrat Lisa Zukoff are members of a House of Delegates Coal Community Work Group. 
They joined a dozen other legislators touring coal communities and asking people what they need to grow and prosper. The number one issue across the state, help with infrastructure. And I think a big part of that is addressing the dilapidated buildings in some of these communities, and that's some legislation you're going to see coming out of this committee as well. So there's legislation on the table to supply communities required matching funds for the federal dollars now available. We also have, like in the mountaintop removal areas, there's nice flat land there. So, but maybe they don't have the access to, you know, water, electric, things that they need. There's legislation moving through that will offer state help to not just coal communities, but all small West Virginia communities with desperately needed issues like economic development planning and grant writing. And legislation to enhance wild and wonderful coal county tourism and local history. Lots of these coal towns had a lot of big things happening when they were booming, so we, we want people to visit these areas. Workgroup members also learned there are other uses for coal besides producing energy. For spacecraft and you know it's very strong it's reasonably inexpensive to work with um, so I'd learned a lot about um, you know the other uses for coal as well. Zukoff says it's rare when committee findings quickly develop into bipartisan legislation that can pass and immediately help people. I think folks really want to see us take action and this committee's allowing us to do that. You can find a link to the coal committee work groups report on our website. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting I'm Randy Yowie. Thanks, Randy. Next Friday, we'll have more news and interviews from the 2022 legislative session. But remember, West Virginia Public Broadcasting is covering the session daily in our radio news program, West Virginia Morning, and on our news site at wvpublic.org. We also broadcast the daily floor sessions of both the House and the Senate on the West Virginia channel, and the legislature today is simulcast on both television and radio every Friday night at 6. I'm Eric Douglas. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for joining us and have a great weekend. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com.